Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to uh, service something uh, a little bit unusual. It's a TiVo Capitan, so a Swedish market watch. Um, TiVo is one of those brands that um, was fairly popular in the Swedish market. This one um, has, you can also identify it being Swedish by the A with the two dots on top of it. And um, yeah, it's a very nice design on this, your classical kind of late 50s, early 60s design. And uh, it's um, a very nice black dial underneath the scratch crystal. So the idea with this watch will be to service it and uh, put it on a nice strap. And I'm going to send it to a fellow YouTuber who doesn't know it yet, but um, I really enjoyed his videos over 10 years. And um, he doesn't seem like the type that uh, wears a wristwatch and maybe I can convince him to do so. Uh, so this is definitely the uh, kind of style and design um, he seems to appreciate. So um, yeah, I'll get on with it. Uh, you can see it has a pretty nicely decorated uh, AS movement. I believe this is a caliber 1560. And um, it's got a very nice finish. It's uh, got 21 jewels, so it's got cap jewels and all the um, all the gear train on the top and the bottom. Um, it's got a bit of dirt in here that uh, we're gonna clean up. The surface, uh, it's not rust, it seems to just be dirt, so that's good. But yeah, we're gonna pop this out of the case, uh, get the dial and hands off. Um, I'm going to clean up this, uh, see if we can polish up the um, minute and uh, hour hand, and uh, see if we can clean up that little sub-second as well. The dial's got a little bit of patine on it, but that's good. Um, so I didn't mention it, but this watch is going to go to uh, Scott at Cold War Motors. As you've also seen on my channel, I'm very into vintage cars and those things, and uh, I've been following his channels over several years, and uh, I thought it would be nice to give him something as a thanks for the entertainment, because I know it's a lot of hard work to put these moments together, uh, videos together, and um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed his stuff, and um, yeah, you, if you watch this, Scott, um, thank you for all the good content, and uh, if you can't be bothered, that's fair enough as well, but um, I have a feeling you'll like this one. So as always, I'm going to uh, do a time-lapse uh, taking this apart because it's pretty much the same as uh, putting it back together, but in reverse order. So we might as well just get cracking on um, getting this movement taken apart. I figured we could have a quick look at the dial. You can see there's a bit of uh, patina on there. Those dots, there's not much we can do about that. That's pretty much uh, gone into the varnish now. It's of course much less uh, visible underneath the crystal, but um, 
I don't mind this kind of patina, it reminds me a bit of a starry sky, but we do have a little bit of gunk around here that I hope a bit of rodico, gentle dab with rodico will clean up. So there's a little bit of grease on there. Looks a bit better. Let's hit a little bit somewhere over here. The coat itself can give a bit of grease sometimes, so we're going to gently go over with a cloth when we're done. Um, don't want to create any small scratches. There's a few hairline scratches on the dial as it is. But uh, we seem to be cleaning that up quite nicely. The hands I've popped in some acetone to dissolve the old luminous compound because it's uh, entrenched with a bit of rust from the um, from the cannon pinion that had rusted the bit. As you might have seen in the uh, taking apart of the watch, it was a little bit difficult to separate the hour wheel from the cannon pinion, but I've done that. I've also broached it out, so it will um, remove any, um, actually it was a smoothing broach, removed any uh, rust from inside the hour wheel and, um, and um, removed any rust from the cannon pinion. It's just a bit of surface rust, so that would be fine. Look at that, the dial's coming up quite nicely. Um, it's just a bit of grease on the top, which the vertigo has successfully removed. It's nice to try and get it as clean as possible. And again, if Scott's watching, it's a black dial with gold markers. And I keep saying you're colorblind, so uh, I guess the gold will kind of pass your head, but uh, there you go. <laughs> So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to put new luminous compound in the um, in the hands and we're also going to put little dots. There's actually infelled holes here for the luminous compound. The old compound's fallen out a long time ago. There's little traces that I've removed. But uh, we're going to do a dot here, here, here and here. And we're also going to fill in the hands again. But. Um, Hard to catch her on camera, but this style actually looks uh, a lot nicer in person than it does uh, underneath this light. So it's going to look really nice when we get this back together. Also, a nice bonus is that the sub dial here with all the grooves is super fine. I call it the vinyl disc, and um, it doesn't have any scratches. Very typical that these are full of scratches from people removing the uh, sub second hand. I've gotten the hands out of the uh, acetone and buffed them a little bit. Um, don't want to overdo it. I don't want to remove any plating from the hands, but a light buff uh, looks uh, so much better. So we're gonna we're gonna line this up on here, and we're going to mix up some luminous compound. I'm gonna do it a little bit of a uh, aged look to it, so it doesn't look too crazy on the uh, patinated dial. That will look fairly nice when we're done, hopefully. The mix I find quite nice on dials like this is uh, one part orange and two part, two part yellow. And, um, and then a tiny bit of umber to make it a little bit more brown-ish. Kind of a nice orange brown is uh, what I like. There we go. There's all different ways you can mix these uh, luminous compounds up. Um, I just did another watch on a weird kind of a dark, where the compound had turned dark, dark green. Um, so common on, come on. Oh, I should be able to leave a droplet of the, there we go, hardening fluid here. That should be enough. So we're going to mix this up. 
Let's start with the um, hard note. The orange takes very, it's, it's a very strong orange, so that kind of takes over very quickly. That's why I mix it out two parts light yellow. So we're going to do that, and we're going to put a tiny bit of umber, brown umber powder. Just about this much. And as you can see, that really changes the colour of this again. So I kind of like a little bit of orangey-brown look to that, and that will look very very nice once it dries out, kind of a beige sand, it's like the orange. All right, let's get this on the hands. So, quite a lot of space we need to cover here. Just wanna drag this along the top. Like so. Capillary action going. Cover that. I know that was a little difficult for myself, but we're getting there. There we go. That's covered. And uh, you can see it's a little thick on the one side. I'll kind of draw that down evenly, like so. I don't want big lumps of compound underneath. We just want to cover the slots. And the reason for that is that. Um, you don't want to compromise the clearance between the hands once the uh, compound's dry. So you just want the minimum amount uh, like this. It's pretty light, uh, but it's going to look very nice with the black background and on the gold hands, I think. So I'm going to do the dial. The dial I'm going to do under the microscope uh, in able to uh, line up the dots. I know it's not a big deal, but I uh, I think little details like that really uh, set a watch off and makes it look good. Um, as you can see, there's a bit of wear on the plate here, and that is because the um, the uh, hole for the upper barrel arbor is worn, so you get a little bit of a end shake on that. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn a new bushing for it and uh, press it in here and then we won't have that end shake anymore. Graver and um, I'm going to turn down <clears throat> I'm going to turn down to the diameter I want to achieve. Two point seventy two. I'll take <clears throat> a tiny bit more off and then I think we're there. somewhere. So here you can kind of see the bushing I've made. It's almost just like a sleeve because it's so thin. 
um, that's just about starting to press in here. So what I'm going to do is um, press this in in the staking set, rivet it in, and um, hopefully that will do the trick. The nice thing when you first have a bushing in there is that next time it gets worn, you just replace the bushing. You don't have to do any more um, modification to the bridge itself, just to replace the bushing. Let's see. Give it a good knock. So that's in there. And uh, this hole might have uh, gotten a bit tighter again. So I'm just going to go over with a smoothing brooch, smoothing brooch and uh, make sure the barrel fits nicely in. So it's not the prettiest bushing I have made, but uh, it uh, does fit the specifications spot on. It's nice and loose and no end shake whatsoever. So this is... Um, it actually looks okay under the microscope. It's just because there's a couple of scratches in the top of the bushing. Um, starting to polish and do all that is a little bit overboard for what we're trying to do on this watch, but uh, it is in my book a fully functioning repair, so I'm happy with that. See how nicely that spins, and yet no end shake, so that's spot on. So what made this one a little bit tricky is because you have this uh, extra depth here. That means that you can't just make the bushing any size you want. So that's why I had to make one with very thin walls. Otherwise you can have a much thicker, robust one, but that will be tricky to get the right height uh, or even if it goes out, you don't really want that. I uh, was chopping wood yesterday, so I'm a little bit shaky. Um, I should stay away from such activities, but uh, I think we'll manage. So I'm trying to get this uh, on the camera, not always easy, but what you see here is the Inca shock spring, which I have lifted up. This is uh, quite an ingenious invention, uh, one of many different kind of shock protections. But the idea is that you have a loose jewel, hole jewel for your balance, that you fit the cap jewel on top, and that's held in place by the spring. And what that does is that when you drop your watch, um, I'll give it a good knock is that you're not going to have all that force go into the balance stuff you're dissipating it with the uh, shock action of the spring so hopefully preventing it from breaking and uh, it's quite effective it really does make a difference in the amount of balance stuff you change uh, if it's uh, shock protected or not uh, so Back in the day, when this watch was new, it was not a given that they all had this. It's only on more pricey watches. So uh, this movement was obviously, you know, it wasn't a bargain. It wasn't a basement uh, movement, movement. It's not one of the most expensive neither. It's just good quality, built well. To be honest, if I was going to give it a point score, it would probably rate quite high because um, the finishes are very good. The, uh, the balance is nicely made, the gear train is nicely made, and uh, it has shock protection, which is, uh, again, not something you always find on watches from this time period, so uh, not as expensive as certain other brands, but not the cheapest either. This is a good, probably, if you're going to compare it to a car, um, I don't know really what you'd compare it to, but it would kind of be a Pontiac uh, or maybe a Buick. Uh, maybe, a, I think a Pontiac or a Chevy, so. It's kind of your, somebody who wanted good quality um, and a little bit extra, but didn't want to pay the uh, top dollar for everything so somebody that was very conscious about the quality would buy this watch as it has proper stainless steel case water resistant or was back in the day um, even has tension tension ring crystal which is quite impressive uh, it has screw back case back uh, which is more expensive to manufacture than the snap-on and uh, much more robust it has pretty pretty good movement and uh, yeah, it's just, it just doesn't have that brand name, uh, which would make it expensive. 
in the same way as a long jeans or Amiga or those things, but the quality is pretty much on par with those brands. So you'd have a, uh, well, the TiVo wouldn't manufacture their own watches, but they would have watches put together for them. So you'd have a dial manufacturer, oops, sending the, uh, dial manufacturer and you'd have somebody making the hands and the movement, the case separately and that would all be put together in a little factory uh, and they would be called Tevos or Viking or whatever other kind of brand they would be putting together in those factories and usually would go to a jeweler or something like that. So. That's why I like this watch, it's really good quality but uh, you know it's uh, it will forever be fairly reasonable in price because it is kind of a brand that nobody knows about anymore. Um, I don't think a lot of people know about this outside of Sweden anyway. So yeah, enough rambling on about that. Um, I did mention this had some capsules and here's one of the lower ones. It only has one lower capsule that comes on here. I don't know if you can see it, if it's, uh, that's the lower capsule here. And it has some very small screws um, accompanying it. Let's see, top ones are even smaller, but. This one, well, you can hardly see it, that's the tiny screw. I'll just line it up here and we'll move it out from underneath the microscope. With the uh, shock jewels now fitted, it's uh, quite nice just to see that the uh, balance moves freely. And it does in every position, which is good. If you have a bent balance staff or the hairspring isn't uh, central, you quite easily see that something, um, so the balance staff would slow down usually quite quickly or you, you can tell certain issues. Uh, whereas if you just put your tire movement together, put your balance in, then you balance jewels, uh, it might stop and you don't know if it's a balance gear train or whatever, but when you can see that the balance moves really like this, you have a good indication that the all balance is fine. Next, I'm gonna take the balance out again and start fitting the um, gear train. Now we're going to put the gear train back together and uh, I'll start by putting a couple of drops of oil in for the uh, lower part of the barrel. I did spill excess, let's wipe that up. Nice, it's gone, good. And we'll drop the barrel, which I have refitted the uh, barrel arbor and the mainspring, that's already back in here. So there, and um, we might as well fit us, well, maybe not center wheel yet. Get the gear train out. Another thing I'm going to do straight away so I don't forget it is the setting lever screw, as if I do forget it, I'll have to take the take the barrel bridge off again. So this comes down here. This is for securing your setting lever later on. But yes, um, let's have a look. The third wheel, center wheel. This is, um, get this in the right order. Fourth wheel, third wheel, center wheel slash second wheel. There we go. Nice. I'm going to do a little droplet of oil on the side here and here. That's prepared. Next, we're going to drop on the barrel bridge. Very nicely made this movement, it really is. Squeeze that on. And now, of course, no more end shake here, which is great. Um, First of all, if you get too much end shake, it's gonna to touch your center wheel, blocking the movement gear train, and you're also scratching up your your uh, plate here unnecessarily. So that's that's nice, that's fixed. Um, 
Next is for the gear train. Oh, we've got to get the escape wheel in as well. Comes in here. That's already got its capsule and oiled on the underside. Now we can get this in. So what I need to do is line up those pivots and I'm going to do that under the microscope as my eyesight uh, will not allow me to see what's going on here. Um, so yeah, be right that's back. the pivots lined up. I will now secure the bridges with the um, bridge screws. Again, very nicely made, highly polished, good quality throughout, very nice finish. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's, uh, it's good, good quality movement. Very enjoyable to work on. work on these every day. I don't mind bringing the lathe up for a little bit of lathe work, get uh, making stuff, especially things that aren't too challenging. Challenging things can be challenging in the fact that you spend hours making something and then it breaks um, then you start again. That is the downside of challenging work. Like if it was challenging, but you were guaranteed that by the end of your efforts, you'd have something that works and it wouldn't be so disheartening, you could say. But uh, really impressed by those who make watches from scratch and they just make the part over and over again until they get it right. There we go. Nice. Um, next, we're going to fit these uh, capsules. And what I've done, I've already pre-oiled these pivots. I'm going to drop these cap caps. Oops. The idea was to drop the cap cap plates. Well, a kind of little plate with a cap in it. Um, these do not have any added shock benefits. Um, these are basically just to keep the oil in place. And another idea is that you don't have too much end shake on your gear train so that the pivots won't move too much up and down, keeping it pretty much in place. Um, that only works on the escape wheel because it has a lower capsule, but the two other ones are a little bit... Uh, well, what can you say? If you have the watch uh, face up, then I guess they do do their job. Uh, the thing with these cap jewels is that they do have exceptionally small screws. Not the smallest ones I've worked on, but they are pretty fiddly. I'm getting a little bit shaky this morning, so let's hope this goes well. Good, there's one in place. So this is demonstration of the size of the screw. This is a pound coin. And uh, yeah, you can see the screw bouncing around there. It's uh, pretty small, so one thing's working on it, but imagine the person that made this on the machine. It's uh, very impressive, or well, just the machine itself. Oh, and there it's gone. No worries, we found it. Let's get that in place. Nice, all the capsules in place. I did remove the click spring uh, in order to clean it up because we did have a lot of surface rust underneath under here that had come from the ratchet wheel, which is here. The ratchet wheel, I also successfully cleaned the rust off using a abrasive brush. Did a pretty good job and then cleaning it. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, we're just gonna fit that uh, spring back in. I'm gonna do that under the microscope, otherwise it might fly away. So, a little fuffing later on. I found a spring that works. Um, I seem to have lost the rusty one. Um, well, it wasn't rusty, the one I had cleaned up. Um, it's probably at the bottom of my cleaning machine, but as I had a one nice one that fits, I'm gonna fit that. So, let's um, get the ratchet wheel back on. Let's fit that uh, ratchet wheel now. We have a new ratchet spring in place. Pulls in like so. Gear train moves freely, that's good. And um, make sure the ratchet wheel is nice and secure. Tighten that, it uh, squeezes together. This is how it should move. I tighten the screw. It's uh, so good. What about now? It's pretty tight. All right, I need to investigate what's going on. Because if I loosen this, let's use the um, pigwood here. That moves as it should. I suspect something to do with the height of the barrel arbor, the way it comes out here, because it's very tight. Um, and it is where it should be be factory wise so hmm I've uh, adjusted the height of the barrel bushing um, and hopefully that will do the trick very tight tolerances on the barrel in this watch um, not a lot of end shake, but there's enough. So hopefully, now when we uh, put the ratchet wheel on, it's going to rotate as it should. Saying that while I'm filming, it might not. So uh, we'll just have to see. This is what really drags out a repair sometimes, is little things like this, where you've done things the way it should be, but for some reason the part is just that tiny bit too short, or just a little bit off, and you end up mucking around for hours trying to get it right. Tight. That's too tight, way too tight. That's not how it should be. Loosen that up again. Let me see how that's working as it should. Hmm. After a bit of thinking, I realized that this is, uh, this was bulging a little bit upwards, which was causing when you tighten it to the sides to actually come down. So I have given a little knock in the staking set with a oval punch 
so that this should now lie higher when you tighten it it um, rather than being squeezed down it will come up a little bit just a tiny 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 bit but hopefully that will be enough so that this ratchet wheel isn't squeezed onto the plate itself and look at that now that is working as it should beautifully excellent so upwards and onwards we have this little protecting ring here that prevents wear on the brass this little steel ring that's always nice and we have our we have put a little drop of oil there crown wheel we have the crown wheel cover screw comes on here like so very nice very happy with that so at this point I think we are going to turn the movement around fit the setting and uh, Winding mechanism. Movement plopped around. I'm going to start by putting a little bit of droplet of oil on the center wheel here. And then we can fit the clutch, or the can pinion, clutch wheel, whatever you want to call it. Press that down, like so. Um, we're going to fit a little bit of oil. I don't have to do this yet. I'll do that later. At the moment, let's fit the Let's put the uh, ratchet wheel sliding, sliding, um, sliding ratchet wheel, um, yeah. sliding pinion. There you go. Uh, get a bit, uh, plenty of words to uh, remember. I don't always remember things, especially when I try to work and talk at the same time. Here we go, sliding pinion in, bit of grease on the teeth on the winding pinion, that gets to go in as well, secure this a bit better here, it's not sitting as I want it to, it's a bit better, good. Now we're going to fit the winding and setting stem. Put a little bit of grease on all the sliding surfaces. This looks uh, much better now that's been cleaned up. You remember how that was before? There we go. And To fit the uh, setting lever, we'll do this manually, take this around. Sorry, I'm off camera. I was trying to tighten this. So what you do is you get this uh, setting lever threaded, get it over where you want it, turn the movement around. That's why you got gloves, They're nice and clean. Make sure this falls into its uh, slot, like so, and we can tighten it down. Nice. That done, we'll, um, we've only got a little bit of grease here. Every kind of surface that slides, um, we pop a little bit of blue grease like this. We're gonna have a little bit of grease on here. A little bit of grease here. Um, next, we have our yoke, yoke lever. That kind of uh, determines the sliding pinion's position, either winding or setting. The yoke has its own spring. 
It will also fit now. to kind of work with two tweezers on this because you can keep hold it down while you tension it. You don't want it to ping away. Next, we're gonna put a little bit of oil on the pillars for the minute wheel and the intermediate setting wheel. If you look at this, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a beveling on that. You want the beveling downwards position engaging with the sliding sliding pinion like so you got your minute wheel coming here You've got a nice big uh, setting lever spring that, um, a good idea to put that in the right right way let's have a look working a bit upside down from what I normally do in this angle. There we go. We've got two screws, so it's going to secure that. <clears throat> There's one. There's two. The screws are sorted in, we can tension the spring onto where it should be, like that. And we can tighten the setting lever spring in place. So the job of the setting lever spring is just basically keep holding it in winding position like this, so you don't have to hold it out constantly. So winding and oh, winding and setting. So the idea is that when the uh, when our pallet fork comes in, it will uh, block the movement from uh, moving freely and the clutch will allow you to turn the hands, you know, set the time. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm gonna pop this around again. Like so, and we're gonna fit the pallet fork. All right, now we're filling, fitting the uh, pallet fork. Again, like with the gear train, I kind of want to have a little look under the microscope before I tighten this so I don't break a pivot. So pivot is safely in its jaw and we can now uh, secure the bridge with a screw. Did that jump off? Let me check. No, it did not. But it's also worth checking before you tighten the screw because uh, that takes about four seconds and replacing the uh, pallet fork can be a big operation for the pallet fork pivot. I have turned, <clears throat> have turned one of those pivots before. It's not fun um, because, um, yeah. Well, now we're gonna wind a movement. We're going to oil the pallet forks. So a little bit of oil here uh, allows the um, escape wheel to um, while the pallet uh, jewel to slide on the escape wheel much easier. So now the moment I've been waiting for, and that is fitting the balance again. And let's see if this will work. I've oiled the pallet fork. I have more detailed videos of that, so I'm not gonna put the same things in every video. If you look at my other videos, you can see that process. Here we go, in with the balance. 
impulse pin on the right position of the hook. Yes, she wants to run. Let's get this incorrect. Why is this so clumsy right now? Here we go. These pins are a little tight. I could broach them up, but um, I think this will be fine. There we go. Lovely. Sometimes I do talk to myself a bit. Uh, it's a little bit of a hazard working alone in the workshop here. Let's secure the balance and see what it does on the time graph. Here we are. We have adjusted the uh, movement. Well, I've adjusted the beta error and I've adjusted the um, timekeeping and um, Last one second a day, not too bad. Dial down, let's turn around to dial up position. Plus two seconds at one. Well, it's probably gonna be losing about a second on that set, minus three, yeah. Still very good uh, positional variation from dial down to dial up. There's nothing really to go wrong here. It's nice and straight. Good beat error still. Amplitude is good. Um, the challenge, of course, is sideways position. So we'll do crown down. Well, sort of, sort of down. Let's adjust it. That's crown down now. Get a little bit of a beat error. But wow, look at that. It's actually... This balance is very nicely poised and uh, it's keeping very good time. Much better than a lot of other watches I've worked on. That just says something about the AS uh, quality here. That's remarkable. That's almost, uh, probably almost be chronometer uh, specifications. So let's do dial, a uh, crown north, let's so crown up. Look at that, wow. This is one of the best performing watches I've done in a while. Okay, it's losing a little bit of time now uh, with the crown in north position. Let's see what it does. Minus nine seconds. But it's quite stable. That's very good. All right, let's do the dial towards the right. Not dial, the crown, I mean. Also have a little bit of time loss to be expected. Let's see, minus 17 seconds. Will that improve? Ah, minus 22. Okay, so we have a little bit of position there. But overall, you know, um, that's the crown to the left. So you have up, down, crown, down, crown, left, crown, up. Very stable, crown to the right, a little bit off. But you know, overall, that's a very good result for what we're trying to do here. That's uh, pretty amazing, actually. Now that I've looked at the movement on the time graph, I'm very happy to put the dial and hands back on and case this sucker. So, first of all, we got to fit the hour wheel. Let's have a quick look at the movement. All nice and clean, ready to be put back in the case stuff now hopefully the uh, hour wheel will just slide nicely on here put a drop of oil here to prevent any corrosion in the future even if the new owner is clumsy and dunks it in water oh very nice super smooth how it should be. Got a nice tension on the clutch pinion as well. This little dial washer, preventing the hour wheel from jumping up if it gets a bit bouncy. A little bit of excess oil that's snuck off. Let's clean that up. There we go, nice. And loosen up the dial screws. And uh, we can fit the dial.
Now I'm going to fit the sub hand, sub second dial, uh, sub second hand. Call it the sub second because the second is in the, underneath the uh, hands. I'm gonna make sure that's got the right height and do that under the microscope. Sub second hand is on the right height. Next, we don't have a date, so we can just fit our, our, our hand wherever. We've got to make sure is uh, the hour hand does not touch the markers and it does not block the sub second hand it's tight but uh, got the correct clearance and the same for let's have a look for the sub second hand see that clears can actually get this a little bit give it a bit more clearance as well there you go, that's on there correctly now. That's better. See, that's nice and tight. Good clearance. And we kind of want the hands to line up on the hour. That should be six o'clock. There a little bit. Let's have a look. Not too bad. Let's have a look at 12 o'clock. Actually, these fin markers is a better way of. Ah, I'm a bit off. Let's see if the dial has any variation. No, I'm way off. It's at 12 o'clock as well. I'm way off. So I'm going to get this off again and uh, reline it. I'm back and now I've aligned this much better. So now it. Um, pretty much where I want it. Six o'clock, about there. You see on the fin markers, it lines up very nicely with 12 o'clock. So yeah, very happy with that. In this light, you can see all the defects in the dial, but to be honest, it gives it a bit of charm. It's not a new watch, it's pretty old. And um, I, uh, I think it's gonna look even better when we get it underneath the new crystal. I did replace the crystal on this. The old one was pretty knackered and has a huge um, crack, tension crack in the crystal itself, so I can't just polish it out. Notice it's a recessed, so it's got a tension ring, but it's also a step tension ring, so luckily I've uh, noticed that, otherwise you won't get the watch in the case. So now I'm gonna take the stem out, pop it back in the new case, and we'll finish off. Nice. So we have these funky case um, clamps here that work a bit like on a Rolex. We actually screw them up, upwards and the edge of the screw will clamp up against the case, securing the movement in the case. Here we go, nice and clean.
What a nice robust movement this is, especially now that we've replaced or we've fitted a uh, bushing on the top here for the barrel arbor. That's not going to wear for a long time and if it's uh, serviced again before it starts wearing, that will last for a very, very long time. Um, I do like the construction of the case. I do like the, how you got the couple of clamp screws to clamp up against the, uh, the movement down into the case. Just overall very good execution. Got a new uh, case back gasket on here to prevent some moisture coming in. Got a new crystal that will do the same, but we do have the old crown. So it won't be waterproof, but it will be water resistant. Secure that case back. And look at that. Let me get some. Uh, look at that. What a transformation. I really like it. Um, really cool watch, really nice details in this watch, put together well, beautiful dial, beautiful patina, I think those hands just really cleaned up beautifully with those nice markers, very, very cool uh, mid-century design. I hope the new owner will be happy with it and wear it, uh, as it should, and uh, yeah, until next time, have a good one.